All right, we can be seated. <clears throat> Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Dr. Ha. Hello. Can you hear me well? Yes, I can. So, Dr. Ha, you didn't write a report in this case, did you? I did not. And we've been asking for it since we talked on June 19th of 2019, correct? Objection, Your Honor. That's beyond what this witness can testify about. That's between the parties and the defense complied with court orders on this. You know, issue. there's a lot of dispute about it. Uh, suffice it to say there was no report written. What else do you want to do? That I asked him for if he had a report on June 19th of 2019. Which is when he talked. Okay, I think that's fair game. That, that was something defense counsel was involved in based on orders of this court. There was no requirement that he write one. That's fine. He was asked for it. It was what the question is. So were you asked for it, Dr. Ha? As far as I know, no. Okay. We didn't discuss whether you would written a report on June 19th of 2019. I don't recall that. Did defense counsel ever ask you to write a report for the no, prosecution? No, I'm going to let you ask. Okay, what, what they did with their expert. So, Dr. Ha, you did provide an expert opinion uh, in an interview on June 19th of 2019, correct? Correct. And we asked you if we could record it to be as accurate as possible. You recall that? Yes, I do. And you declined to allow us to record it, correct? Correct. And you've had approximately two years to provide any clarifications or additions to that expert opinion, correct? Correct. And you've given us no more reports or opinions after that interview. Is that accurate? That's correct. On June 19th of 2019, you stated that you formed an opinion based on material you rev you'd reviewed with regard to the validity of cadaver dogs, correct? Correct. And at that time, you'd received hundreds of files um, and records in discovery. That's correct. And that included all the exhibits that the jury's already seen, right? Correct. Because we give all those materials to defense counsel and to you to review, correct? Correct. And you reviewed them for a few months before you gave that opinion on June 19th of 2019, correct? Correct. And then you also provided a curriculum vitae to the people um, back in June of 2019 or thereabouts, right? That's correct. And that was the curriculum vitae we talked about that didn't have any training with cadaver dogs, human remain dogs, or handling listed on it. Correct? That is correct, yes. And it had no experience handling a human remains detection dog on it, correct? Correct. No publications in the area of human remain detection canines or canine handling, correct? Correct. Sorry, correct. And back in 2019, that CV that the jury heard about, that was primarily about the behavior of animals, right? Correct. And your work at the time was prim primarily as a behaviorist who helps people in their homes with pets, correct? No, my, my work is as, my primary work is as an academic professor at the University of Washington. That's a sideline helping people in their homes. At that course, have you ever taught human remains detection canine handling? I have discussed the principles of canine handling for human remains detection, yes. Have you had a course listed as that at the university, sir? No, only as a topic within other courses. And it's nowhere on your CV. You'd agree with me? No. Uh, okay. Yes, I would agree with you. And you've, and in our interview, you said you'd testified as an expert before, correct? That's correct. And at the time that I asked you about that, you couldn't tell me the jurisdictions or the case numbers, right? That's correct. And you couldn't tell me they weren't listed on your CV that you provided to the people, right? That's correct. And you couldn't even tell me the area of expertise you were qualified in back in June 19th of 2019 so that I could go look into it. Is that correct? That's correct. I don't keep a record of that. Now, you mentioned your work with the FBI that you called training the trainer. You recall that? I do. And you did that even though you've never done the work yourself? That's correct. And you've never brought a dog through certification process? That's correct. And you've never been invited to sit on a board that certifies canines and handling? That's correct. And that's not on your CV either, any work with the FBI? Correct. 
So again, we can't reach out and verify what your actual role was in training the trainer, correct? Correct. And now today, after preparing for trial testimony, you said several things for the first time. Am I right? I don't know what you're alluding to. You gave a specific analysis of searches that didn't talk that you didn't talk about in our interview, correct? Yes. And in our interview with your expert opinion, you never before said that there was a 24 to 48 hour time span on residual odor, correct? I don't I don't recall. I've always believed that that was true, so I don't know why I would not have. But. And normally I give you the courtesy of letting you review this each page report, but you're remote. You recall talking to investigator Heidel on June 19th of 2019. Yes, I do. And nowhere in that report do you give any time frame on how long residual odor remains. I will take your word for it. Mr. Moran? Oh. Okay, go ahead. That's a new opinion for today. I, I, hold on, hold on, there's an objection, Mr. Moran. The court has allowed its basic trial it, it, it's it's basic for trials when experts are testifying that they can remark on the information provided by by other folks in the trial and that's what he's doing so of course there are new things based on the testimony provided by the prosecution this is not relevant helpful or helpful to the jury so 401 and 403 of course it's relevant well, your it's, honor it's relevant <clears throat> highly relevant it will have them rule it in your favor so you thank you Jane. anything go ahead have you ever provided any materials in this case ever that suggested that there's a time limit of 24 to 48 hours on residual odor? Mr. Moran, is that the same objection? Your Honor, he has. This is mischaracterizing what happened. I, so I, if he's going to impeach him, he's going to need to use the document to do so. Not necessarily. He can call uh, Mr. Heidel up as a uh, for a prior inconsistent witness if that's what, how he chooses to go. <laughs> so you understand? Questions are not evidence, all right? You can rely on what the expert, well, not the experts, but the, well, the experts, but the witnesses uh, and any future witnesses to make your determination. Go ahead. So that's a, have you ever provided any information to the prosecution in this case that there's a 24 to 48 hour time limit on residual order? I don't, I don't know. I, I may not have. I was never, if I was not asked the question, I would not have provided the information. Have you ever published anything that suggests that? Cite me, cite me something in publish peer-reviewed literature that says 24, 48 hours. Cite that to I, me, please. I can't do that off the top of my head. There's, there's a number of publications about volatile organic compounds. I have a literature search and a database full of those papers, but I don't have those at my fingertips. But you're the expert here coming in here purporting to know about human remains detection canines, correct? Correct. And you know residual odors fundamental to the discussion hold on, hold on. This is getting argumentative. No, his voice is just getting loud. The questions aren't argumentative at this point. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. And you're aware that this issue is one before the jury today, right? You knew that coming in? Yes. Okay. And you have a PhD? Yes. In zoology? You yes. You purport to have read the literature on topic, and you can't cite me a single site on that? Yes. There's a large literature on this, and I cannot cite you an a, a individual article on it. Okay. Defendant's paying you to be here, right? That's correct. Okay. Um, he's paying you for all of your work on this case, correct? Uh, hold objection, on. Actually, Your Honor. Hold on. What's your objection? Everybody who's testified in this case got paid. I hope not. Well, uh, maybe experts have been. Right. All this right. Is, this that, is not and, and that's relevant. fine, but this is totally fine, Mr. Moran. This is typical cross-examination on an expert witness. The, the first question, fine, but to delve into this and the way he's doing so and to have Mr. Redwine implicated in it is a, violative, in my mind, of 1.6. That's something that Mr. Redwine uh, has the ability through his attorneys to have privileged. That, that's no. not a thing, Judge. No, we're not going to go with any into any privilege. He can talk about how he's getting compensated. That that's perfectly fine. It's it's appropriate for the jury to consider in terms of judging credibility. 
So go ahead. So, Doctor, how you you live in Key West, Florida, right? Uh, Marathon, Florida. Oh, okay. And you have no certified uh, human remains detection handling experience, correct? That's correct. But the defense has reached out to you all the way in Florida to pay you for your time to review records in this case about human remains detection canines, right? That's correct. And then pay you to watch the testimony of the handlers, I believe, right? Sit in on it so that you could comment afterwards. Correct. And they pay you for any report writing, which as you advertise on your website, although here they chose not to, correct? Correct. They paid you to fly in from Florida to come testify and give your opinion uh, on Friday, and then to, they're continuing to pay you to give your opinion today. Yes. Okay. I want to discuss a couple of um, general principles with you, if you would. So are you aware of some of the national certification processes and how they work? Uh, not in any detail, no. Do you know the certification process that K-9 Molly went through? Uh, only that she went through a standardized certification process, yes. You don't know the details of what that process looked like, and you have an opinion in this case? Yes. So do you know what agencies, national agencies, that certify police dogs all the time that go into service, do you know what national agencies those are that she certified with? Yes, and, and as I've already testified, I am not a handler. I am not a certification expert. I am not an expert on how these certifications are, are put together. Um, I am addressing the, the value of the evidence from the scientific point of view on basic principles of dog cognition and learning. So I am happy to accept that there is a national certification program and that Molly passed that. And I, I, I don't need to know the details of it, that I accept that it was nationally certified. Well, I thought so too, Doctor. I thought that's what your expertise was going to be. But then during your direct testimony, you talked an awful lot about, for example, Ray Randolph certification. You recall those questions? Uh, only the type of certification that she had. Okay. And you also talked a lot about the things that the handlers did and the reliability of it. And you stressed that training is important. That's correct. And having an unbiased person do that certification is important. That's correct. Because it, de it demonstrates reliability in a controlled setting. So then when that dog is deployed, we can trust the reliability of that dog. I have no argument with this. Okay. So I just want to ask you about some general principles, however. So you know, at least I would assume, doctor, that when a dog certifies, that the handler works with the dog to certify. I'm sorry, I missed the last part. Works with the dog. That an independent certifier sets up the problems and the handler works with a specific dog to do the certification. You're at least aware of that, right? Absolutely. Okay. And when they certify, they're certified together as a team, correct? Absolutely correct. Okay. But when you originally opined on this case, it was your original opinion that the handler should not be present for the work as a measure to avoid queuing, correct? That's correct. And you suggested, despite the certification of the dog and handler being together, that someone else should handle the dog. That was something you said in your expert opinion, correct? Correct. Now, Doctor, you're familiar with Dr. R. Padboss's work, right? Yep. Yes. And you've had the opportunity to review it, right? Yes. Tell me if I'm getting anything wrong, but Dr. Arpad Voss has endeavored to define a specific odor signature for human cadavers. Exactly. Okay. And in doing so, he's determined there are 478 volatile organic compounds. Correct. And this is different than any other composition out there, right? That's it's correct. Unique. And it's different than, for example, animal... Uh, odor signatures decom decomposing, correct? That's not correct. So your testimony here today is that a decomposing animal has the same odor signature as a decomposing human? Not, a, not the same odor signature, but an overlapping odor signature. Well, sure, a lot of things have overlapping odor signatures, correct? Correct. 
But Dr. Arpad Voss, who you, whose literature you're familiar with, has identified that the human remains are unique and different from animal remains. Human remains have over 400 different compounds when they decompose. A significant portion of those compounds are shared by other mammals, by other animals. And so humans do have a unique um, uh, collection of odors, but many of those odors are shared by other animals when they decompose. Yes, you already said they overlap, but my question is, are they unique to each other? They, the collection of them are unique to each other. Yes. Thank you, doctor. And that's why it's important that dog handlers train only on real human remains, right? Uh, that's correct. There's been some history back in uh, older times when people would train on pig remains because they had a, some overlap in the signatures, right? Uh, it's still very common just to, to use pig remains for training, yes. But you're aware from Swig Dog and Dr. Arpad Voss, et cetera, that what you should do is train on real human remains for that reason. That's correct. That's how you create a dog that will identify on real human remains and not have a false positive on animal remains, correct? Uh, that's never been demonstrated. Um, the problem is that we can't get inside the dog's mind and know which of the 470 some odd odors the dog is queuing on. There's no evidence that the dog is queuing on the collection of the unique collection of 478. So we don't know what one or multiple smells, odors, chemicals the dog is queuing on. And therefore, we don't know whether it's queuing on ones which will overlap with animals or not. Well, you don't know that, but a trainer that has trained on human remains only and proofed off of animals and done various documented training exercises and has gone through national certification processes, a handler like that's going to know that, right? Objection compound. It's no, it's not. It's fine. <clears throat> You can answer the question. Uh, can you restate the question? Yes. I said, you said you don't know what's in a dog's mind. But a handler who does training exercises to proof their dog off of animal remains, who documents those training records, who takes that dog to a national agency to certify, that person's going to know from the training and performance in a controlled setting that the dog can distinguish the two odors, correct? No. That individual is still not going to know how the dog is perceiving the world inside its mind. It okay. knows that it will do it accurately under those specific conditions. Yes. Sure. So you're going to agree with your original opinion today that one of the reasons a certified, nationally certified dog with field experience and training that's put out on important missions might have false positive in this case is because of something like a dead mouse is close enough. That's your opinion? That is. I mean, that's one possibility. Close enough. A dead mouse is close enough. It that's may be close enough. It may be close enough. Let's talk about Karen Corcoran. You ever observe Karen Corcoran work? No. You ever see her work with a human remains detection dog? No. You ever see her work with a trailing dog or a narcotics dog or a police dog as a sworn police officer investigating a crime? No. Did you observe her work in this case? No. Did you see any of the areas that she searched in person? No. Did you go out to the residence or the mountain or any of those areas? No. Did you ever meet canine Molly? No. So you've never seen her work? Correct. Correct? You've never seen her in a training setting? Correct. You've never seen her out in the field? Correct. And you didn't actually observe the work that she did in this case. That's correct. You just read some reports. Correct. correct. Are you aware that Molly has previously given a trained final response on residual odor four years after the human remains were removed? No. Didn't you watch her testimony? Uh, only parts, parts of it. Are you aware that in this case, Molly did a car lineup with over a dozen cars where she had no information, the handler had no information as to which cars had dead bodies and she was able to indicate on two of them, you're aware of that? Yes. You're aware that both those bodies had been removed for over a year and she got both cars? 
Yes. She didn't alert on any of the others? Yes. And you're aware in one of those cars that there was no blood or guts or gore. It was a person who had overdosed and had only been in the car 20 minutes and was still warm to the touch a year earlier. You're aware of that, right? Yes. How many bodies has Molly found in her time working as a human remains detection doc? I don't know. You have an opinion on her reliability and you don't know how many bodies she's found? No. You'd agree I put that material in discovery for your re review, correct? Uh, yes. I, I, I'm not questioning that Molly is a highly trained cadaver dog. I'm questioning the idea of residual odor. So you're aware in this case she didn't indicate on every room, right? Correct. You're, you'd agree she didn't indicate on every article of clothing, correct? Correct. And she didn't indicate on every truck she searched, correct? Correct. And are you aware that up on Middle Mountain Road, the areas that she did indicated were right in the general area of where Dylan's body had been chewed up by animals and dispersed as they scavenged? Are you aware of that? Oh, correct. And you're aware that the areas she indicated were areas where snow had melted and rain had melted and she was able to find locations in there, the odor of human remains with the train's final response. You're aware of that as well, right? Objection as to the form of that question. I, I think that it's assuming facts, not in evidence. Well, I think it's in evidence. That dog's not alerting to any place things were found. The closest it gets is 20 that wasn't, feet. That wasn't the question. That wasn't the question. Go ahead. You aware of that, doctor? I'm aware that she provided a number of false positives and that nothing was actually found in the locations that she indicated. Doctor, you've already testified on direct that you don't call it a false positive in the field because you don't know if there's human remains there or not when the dog indicates. You remember testifying to that? Now wait, I'm, I'm a, my understanding is that she indicated in several locations and nothing was found in those locations. Right. But, well, I understand you don't believe in residual odor, but what we were talking about here is an area where it was documented that there had been numerous human remains scattered, drugged, and moved about in that same area where she's doing train's final response. It'd be your position that that's a false positive? We've seen the evidence that the, the testimony about the pinpointing and the very precise accuracy of these dogs and so if nothing is found in that location, to me, that has to be a false positive. Uh -huh. So in your original opinion, on June 19th of 2019, after months of reading the records, right, and hundreds of records had been provided to you about uh, Officer Corcoran at the time, in that original opinion, you cited only three specific concerns you had with Officer Corcoran's handling, correct? Correct. You were concerned with queuing. You were concerned with the time passed, and we'll, we'll get to residual loader. And you were concerned that she was not certified. That's what you put in your expert opinion, correct? Correct. So let's start with queuing. I, do, I think we'd all agree queuing can be a problem for dog handlers, correct? Correct. You need good practices to prevent this. We can all agree on that? Correct. To prevent this, you listed some of the things in your original opinion that you'd like to see. For example, working a dog off leash, right? Correct. Minimal information going into a search. Correct. Blind testing. Correct. Certification to prove they can do it by an unbiased evaluator. Correct. Not letting a dog run in an area for too long. Correct. And to reward whether or not there is a train final response. Correct. You'd agree with me that these are all good measures to prevent queuing. Correct. Let's talk about um, cadaver odor uh, in general. So you understand that residual odor is a term of art and it has a definition and it's acknowledged by Swig Dog. You'd agree with me on that, right? Uh, residual odor is, there, is, there are not standards in Swig Dog for residual odor. That's not what I asked you. I asked you, is, will you agree with me that residual odor is a concept that is acknowledged by Swig Dog? It's even defined. Yes, yes, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. And generally speaking, it's when odor is left behind and the human remains are no longer there, right? Correct. And you'd agree with me that 
it's the same odor, it's just possibly reduced quantity? Uh, we don't know that. Well, you knew that on June 19th of 2019 when you interviewed with Investigator Heidel and myself, right? Uh, it will, okay, let me rephrase then. A it, it will be reduced concentration. No, yes, no question about that. But it may also be different compounds. In other words, only certain compounds may remain as residual. Your statement to Investigator Heidel was, you explained that you see the difference in being the difference in how the odor is transferred and the quantity of odor. You recall that? Objection. Yes. This has got to be asked did you say that but too late this is improper impeachment that's not he's reading it the jury can see him reading it and then he's saying this is what you said um right so reading transcripts or, or mr heidel's report into the record is what i'm saying is improper impeachment well, you is, ask the witness did you say this and you on. impeach them later i don't see a difference here again questions are not evidence ladies and gentlemen listen to the responses go ahead and, you, and your response in this instance to you see the difference in being the difference in how the odor is transferred and the quantity of odor, your answer to that was yes. Correct. Okay. And additionally, you added that it would be the same odor, but you would want to know that the canine could locate the reduced quantity. That was another statement you made in your expert opinion, correct? Yes. You'd agree with me that there's no actual published literature that distinguishes the odor signature, correct? Distinguishes what? The, which odor signature? A unique odor signature different for residual odor than for human remains odor. No, there's no literature. Okay. And you've never published anything on the topic? No. And there's no distinct, distinction in the certifying organizations or SWIG dog. There's no specific training track or certification for residual odor, right? That's correct. They just certify in the odor of human remains, be it residual or not. They only certify with, on the existence of remains. Right, but the canine is indicating on the odor, correct? Correct. Let's talk a little bit about studies regarding residual odor. Um, you, you talked about swig dog and how that's a concept within swig dog, right? And we already talked about 24 to 48 hours, and you agree with me there's just no studies that say anything like that, right? That's correct. Okay. And are you aware of any studies that um, suggest that there is a time limit on residual odor? There are no studies on residual odor. This is my educated opinion. Based on what? Based if on... It, if it's not, let me ask you a different question. If it's not based on published literature in the field, what is it based on? So it's based on studies of volatile organic compounds produced by decomposition and the rate at which they decompose in the environment. So there are studies on the topics, though, that indicate that residual odor can be found at lengths of time after the remains have been removed, correct? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Okay, well, let's just talk about, well, let's just start with an easy one, Dr. Arpad Voss, right? Yes. His studies are collecting odor, right? Correct. He creates an instrument that collects the odor. It's not as sensitive as a dog, and he'd be the first one to acknowledge it if you speak to him. But what he does is he actually collects the odor in the air. He's not collecting the human remains. Isn't that correct? That's correct. So his scientific instrument is showing that you can, in fact, collect residual odor, and it's not as good as a dog. Yes. We talked about carpet squares, right? And that's a peer-reviewed scientific article, right? Correct. And that's from Science Direct. That's cadaver dogs, a study on detection of contaminated carpet squares, right? Uh, that's not the journal, but uh, that's where the library, where you got the article from, but yes. Is it Forensic Science International? That's correct. Thank you, sir. So, and counsel asked you about the problems with it, but he didn't talk to you about what the actual project and findings were in detail, right? Right. And what we learned from that study 
was that these were bodies that had been in no contact with the surface at all, right? The carpet squares. Correct. And they had been dead only two hours or less, right? Correct. And they had been present only for 10 minutes at the location, correct? Correct. And when they were present for 10 minutes at the location, there was a 98% rate 65 days later that they were able to detect residual odor. Correct. That's what they report. Agree. And that's a lot longer than 24 to 48 hours. Wouldn't you agree? I agree. Where's the study that debunked this study? Cite us, cite us the doctor and the article that's peer reviewed and published that debunked the carpet squares. At, very, at this time, there is not yet one. Okay, but you talked about repetitiveness being helpful and, and part of the scientific process, right? Correct. Are you aware of Dr. Michael Alexander's work? Uh, no. No? You're an expert no. in the field. You're here testifying as an expert before the jury, and you're not aware of his work? That's correct. Are you aware that he determined residual odor? could be up to 667 days after human remains were removed with eight certified human human remains detection canines? Objection no, I'm not aware of that. Hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, the foundation, this is proper impeachment. I mean, whether or not that comes into evidence is a different story, but he can ask the question. Sure. He, he would have to establish some other things, though, to for this to be a learned treatise or something relied on in the field. There's a lack in qualification here. So you're objecting that uh, the treatise is not something relied upon in the field? Yes. That, okay, and that's fine, but that's, that's, that's a different objection than you first made, so go, go ahead. Would you agree with me Forensic Science International is a reliable source that is peer-reviewed? Uh, yes. Okay. So you're not aware of the study um, with Michael Alexander's work that I had just referred that had eight certified was, human remains. Was, was it published in that study? In that Magazine or periodical? Yes, Your Honor. I'm, I'm holding it. When was it? When was it? Do you have a, a date? Yes, 2014. I thought I had said. Um, I believe it's 2015. All right. All right. Go ahead. What's the name of it? Application of Soil and Forensic Science, Residual Odor, and Human Remains Detection Dogs. You read it, you're aware in this study that it was determined 667 days after the remains were removed, and that was by eight certified human remains detection canines. He, he would not be aware of that, having not seen this article. Well, so he, so he, can, he can ask if he's, uh, he, he can still ask if he's familiar with this, uh, this article and what it found, and then that's pretty much it for the, uh, for impeachment on that at least this issue. Least. I'll ask a different question, Your Honor. All right. So you're unaware when you issued your expert opinion in this case to 24 to 48 hours that four single purpose and four dual purpose canines blind tested were 75% to 100% accuracy when the remains were not present. You were unaware of that 667 days when you gave your expert opinion to the jury about 24 to 48 hours. That is correct. You're also unaware that some of those dogs went through NNDDA and NAPWA national certifications just like Officer Corcoran's dog. You're unaware of that too? I'm unaware of the study. Therefore, I am unaware of anything having to do with the study. So you'd agree with me certification is very important? Yes. And when you um, issued your opinion on June 19th of 2019, at the time of that opinion, your concern was that Officer Corcoran's dog had no certification. That's what you told us in the interview, correct? That's correct. Okay. And part of the basis of your opinion as to her reliability was your concern that she didn't have records that indicated she'd been tested, right? Correct. One of the primary concerns was a, quote, lack of certification, right? Correct. And you were concerned that Molly didn't have unequivocal testing or assessment, correct? Cor correct. That was your understanding and issue and opinion after having the records for a few months? Correct. 
Would you agree with me? Object. Hold on, hold on. There's an objection. Object to any further discussion about the records. This was something that the prosecution did not want us to get into. And so if the records are going to be discussed, it's beyond the scope. This goes to, uh, I think I know where this is going based upon previous testimony. And, you know, this is being brought up now. In, uh, you may be able to go into, go into it on redirect. We'll see. If it's helpful, Judge, these are, these are quotes from that report that he's been limited to. So I'm actually reading from the, the I, I understand, I understand okay. that, but that's not what Mr. Moran is saying. Mm -hmm. um, so go ahead. You'd agree with me that there are good dogs and good handlers out there that do good work, wouldn't you? Absolutely correct. Okay. And doctor, would you agree with me that dogs can smell what we can't at a very sensitive level? That's correct. And you'd agree with um, Dr. Arpad Voss and some of the findings of Dr. Alexander that there's just no man-made instrument that can smell as sensitive as a dog? Uh, that's changing rapidly, but I'll accept that. I mean, even Dr. Arpad Arpad Voss, who's at the cutting edge and creates the instrument called the Labrador, et cetera, to try to capture that residual odor, right? He's able to do it, but he would acknowledge not even to the level of a canine's nose. Um, it's, it's my opinion that Dr. Arpad Voss is not necessarily the cutting edge work. He's done incredible, excellent work, but there are other labs which are uh, doing going in other directions. Yes. Okay. But you'd agree that well-trained dogs and certified dogs, if they're trained properly, they can tell us what they're smelling by their final, trained final responses, right? With a high, but I believe to be, for the court of law, a relatively high error rate, yes. Well, it's a useful tool in the field. You'll at least agree with me on that, right? I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Sorry, it's a useful tool in the field. You'd at least agree with me on that. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And they're sent out and they're sent out to do what we can't do in matters of importance on a regular basis, right? That is correct. They're sent out to find a missing child in the woods sometimes, right? Correct. Uh, sorry, correct. They're used to scan for explosives in, a, in airports, for example. Very serious, important work, right? Correct. They're sent out to find the bodies of loved ones out in the field so that they can have closure, right? Correct. And they help police every day in different tasks like finding drugs and pe keeping people safe. We rely upon them for that because of their ability with their nose and their ability to tell us what they find, right? Absolutely correct. And what you'd like to see is some corroboration when you see these findings, such as blood, such as bones, such as DNA. Correct. Now, you'd agree with me that a, um, a trained uh, human remains detection dog is not going to be any use to anyone if it hits on every single hair in a house. Wouldn't you agree with that? That's correct. And you'd agree with me that a trained human remains detection dog is not going to be any use to anyone if they hit on every skin cell that's been sloughed off on a piece of furniture, right? Correct. The reason they're deployed to do the work that they do is they're able to distinguish those types of things where they'd hit on every couch, bed, and bathroom in every single house they go into, right? That's correct. You'd agree, we already talked about certification being important, but there are other things that you would describe as good qualities in a handler, right? Good, good policies they do, good training and, and work that they do, right? Correct. So rewarding even when a dog finds nothing, that's something that you would you would agree is a good thing to do. Yes. And a good handler also, you prefer a single discipline, right? That's correct. And you prefer working off leash to help reduce cueing, right? That's correct. And you also agree that less information about their what they're gonna find, as in specific areas of evidence, for example, is a good thing to reduce cueing as well. Correct. And then they should be trained on what they're going to do. For example, I think you testified on direct. You talked about using large source training if you want to find large source scent, correct? Correct. Okay. All of these qualities make for a better handler. Correct. You'd agree with me with regard to Karen Corcoran and Molly that you believe them in your expert opinion to be a higher quality team, correct? 
That is correct. And in your expert opinion, you were happy to say that Corcoran's team was much higher quality than others you've seen. That's correct. And you were happy to report that they were good records, good training techniques, and good quality of training, correct? Absolutely correct. And those were all things that you said on June 19, 2019, indicating that her and Molly were a good team even before you realized that she'd been certified annually by a national agency as well. Correct. Thank you, sir. Redirect. Thanks, Your Honor. Dr. Ha, is the concern here that the training Mr. Johnson has been referring to was not in residual odor detection? Well, the concern is twofold. The first is, of course, that the training was not in residual odor detection. The second is that I think um, that the training team that we're talking about was very high quality, which means it's going to meet the, the highest level of, of uh, or I guess I should say the lowest level of error rate, the highest success, proper success rate. And that's about 60 to 80 percent. And so I believe that she and her team is easily able to accomplish that 70 percent accuracy that we have from the scientific literature. Okay, hold on. Uh, what's your objection? I object to that information without a citation to some kind of literature or study based on the nature of his expertise. You know what? I'm going to overrule you. Go ahead. With respect to the study that the prosecution was just referring to by uh, Michael Alexander, would, would you disagree with his finding that remains in soil from under a decomposing human that a dog could could detect that so if the the body was removed but it had decomposed over the soil isn't it your position as you discussed in discussing grave soil that a dog could do that oh certainly absolutely no no question so you're not in, in fact disagreeing with what this Al alexander researcher said right i have if that's what Alexander said, then it's um, it, that then it's absolutely correct. I, I agree, and that's been substantiated uh, numerous times. The prosecution was inquiring after um, your, your remarks that residual odor is something that has reduced concentration and different compounds than a scent source actually present. Correct. It, it, and is that part of these things being perishable? That's, cor that's correct. And each of these, each of these vol volatile organic compounds will decompose at different rates. And so the actual signal uh, changes over time. And so that's a huge issue with how the training is done as well. Um, because of the training is done in rather short order decomposition uh, and you're looking for long term things and so on the comp the signature the the combination of 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 molecules in that signature will change and and that's why I brought it up <laughs> I, I'm worried that I've gotten so in the weeds on these understandings that it might be missed on normal people but th is it would it be fair to say that a stinky shoe smells different when you stick it right under your nose than, say, a room that smells like stinky shoes. Are there different volatile organic compounds that a sensing creature senses when they have their nose right at the shoe or when they just walk into a room where there was once a stinky shoe? Does that make sense? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure um, if the what? stinky room is stinky from exactly the same reason as the stinky shoe they'll smell the same unless there's been a different time element because at, these things disappear and decompose at different rates i see so i'm not sure where, where you're going with that question okay maybe a bad analogy is it fair to say that different volatile organic compounds are present if you have a decomposing body than if you have a room where a decomposing body once was, but has now been removed. 
Objection. He answered this question on cross-examination to suggest that he had no studies to support this, so it's beyond his expertise. Mr. Marin? The, the concentration of volatile organic compounds in a particular location changes over time. I think that's what he means by perishable. I just want to have some clarification as to right, these I'll questions. You, you, go ahead. Doctor, does that make, does, does it make sense? I, I'm sorry about the stinky shoe analogy. Does that make more sense to consider it in that way? From basic scientific chemistry, basic principles, volatile organic chemicals break down at different rates. So time is an influence and will alter the chemical signature of the room or the shoe or whatever. Has there been study to confirm that at 24 to 48 hours, that smell is that residual odor will leave or, or will dissipate if there is no nothing left there. If there's no hairs, no fingernails, nothing, it's totally removed. The science, what does it say? Okay, so the evidence that we have and the basis for my opinion about residual odor is based on the literature from the breakdown, the many, many, many chemical studies of the breakdown of volatile organic compounds. So the studies have not been done in the framework of uh, murder scene, um, uh, you know, death, um, forensics, and what we're calling for residual odor. We're stepping back to first principles and our understanding of the breakdown of volatile organic chemicals, which is almost entirely completed in 24 to 48 hours. What scientifically is the problem where the trained response of the animal is not corroborated by finding something? Could you restate the question? I'm sorry. Yes, sir. What is the problem with the alert where it's not corroborated, where you don't find something? The problem with an alert where you don't find something is we don't know why the dog is alerting. These dogs are not perfect. They're animals. They make mistakes. And so if the dog gives an alert and you find something, hurrah, good for the dog, good for the evidence pool and, and everything else. You may have found something, as was pointed out by the prosecution, that we would not have found otherwise. Very useful. But if the dog alerts and there's nothing there, there are multiple reasons why the dog may have alerted, including cueing, rewarding, or maybe a residual odor. But we don't know. And so the probability of those false positives is high enough, in my opinion, that they do not provide realistic, valid information. Is that Was that clear? I think so. The, the, another thing inquired after a moment ago was that these dogs are helpful in, in finding lost people, finding drugs. Um, it, if drugs are not found, though, should we treat people as though they had the drugs because of an alert? Objection. That's this, our, that is argument. Yeah, and that is something you can argue to the jury if you want to on closing. <clears throat> Doctor, were the carpet studies called into question by other reputable scientists? Yes, in personal communication. And the findings that were described by the prosecution with this carpet study, they have not been replicated to your knowledge? That is, is that correct, fair? yes. And you've been, how long have you been aware of this study? Oh, many years. And have you been watching out for someone to corroborate it. Would that be interesting based on your field of study? Yes, it would be. We're in the midst of, we've just completed submitting a proposal to replicate the work ourselves uh, with my colleagues at the University of Tennessee, and so we are very aware of, of that literature. And one of the folks you work with at the University of Tennessee is a gentleman referenced by the prosecutor, Arpad Voss. Do you recall that question? Yes. And are you aware that Arpad Voss sampled the air in the Dodge in this case? Objection. Uh, yes. First, hold on, hold on, hold on. That's not true. So if he just answered that, then he doesn't know. But the, the counsel just injected something into the case that is false. 
And we can approach if, if necessary, Josh. It's been testified to by multiple witnesses. No, and I, I don't believe it has. The, I think it was vacuum. I believe it was mentioned that that was a possibility. I don't believe it was ever mentioned that it was done. No. It's the jury's memory. Get off this issue. But the jury's memory is what matters as to what the evidence was, not ours. Go ahead. Based on your scientific understanding, is it fair to think that residual has a time limit on it? Or is some place that once smelled of something going to always smell of that thing? Residual, I firmly believe from scientific principles that residual odor will have a time limit. Is it helpful to think of it in terms of how you will not always smell like the subway sandwich shop you went into or the pizza place you went into? Eventually, that smell will dissipate. Objection. This has all been asked and answered at this point, Judge. Yeah. It's pretty obvious, too. I mean, I'm going to sustain it just on the waste of time factor. Um. Professor, when you were invited to, to be a part of this case, did you learn that the dog Molly that you were asked about was at that point already deceased? Yes, I believe I was. Well, objection or relevance? Well, it's relevant based on your questions. So what we were left with or what you were left with were reports re provided by Karen Corcoran. Is that fair? That's correct. And you made your opinion based on reports that she wrote. In part, yes. And there were some questions about how Molly had, in fact, on occasion found bodies. Is that surprising based on her training? No. And with description of an occasion where four years after a body had been removed, there was still residual present. Are there circumstances where you believe that might be the case? For instance, some confined area where there are things present? Yeah, it certainly could occur in a confined area. It could also occur if there actually is material still somewhere present in the area. So uh, an extreme decomposition event that occurs in the trunk of a car that trunk might smell like decomposition for a long time. Is that consistent with your scientific expertise? Certainly that would slow down that breakdown of the residual odor or it's a complex environment and it's possible, for instance, that, a, that while the dog indicated there, a forensic team was not able to locate the materials which are de currently decomposing. The discussion about the, the volatile organic compounds that have been identified, isn't it true that they have not all been identified? They, they've narrowed it down and they think they've got an idea. But uh, is anybody saying we know exactly what the perfume of death is? No, it's, it's absolutely not. And what we're actually finding is because of the differing genetics of the of people and animals that it differs from person to person in some ways. And we really don't know whether that's in small ways or very large ways. So when there are, as was discussed, some 400 plus that are associated with humans, you talked about overlap. Does anybody know which ones are overlapping? So are the ones that are associated with humans overlapping with the ones associated with other decomposition? And yes. And we, if I understand those, your question, there is an overlap in some of the chemicals. We don't know. It's not done. We haven't quantified them all, as we just said. And so we don't know to what degree they overlap, but certainly we know that they do overlap. 
And the other sort of confounding thing with those studies is that those compounds exist in different concentrations at different times during the decomposition process. Is that a, a fair under, scientific understanding? That's my understanding, and that's why we don't know these things, is it's a very complex system. And that's why we don't understand it yet, and so we don't understand what it is exactly that the dogs are, are detecting. A body decomposing for less than 24 hours, would that body smell different to a dog than a dog or, or than a body, say, in a graveyard or that has been decomposing for months? Those would be emitting different volatile organic compounds and therefore would have a different signature. How Whether the dog dis distinguishes between them or not, we don't know. And there was some question about how you had not seen uh, Ms. Corcoran Gumming working her dog. Um, would it have been helpful to have video of that dog working? Um, perhaps to, to, to look at uh, the ways that she was or was not um, minimizing um, handler error and some things like that. So it, it usually is useful to get an idea about um, how the, the handler team is, is interacting in both directions, both from the dog point of view as well as from the handler's point of view. And when you train the trainers, are you giving consultation on how to make those trainings standardized? Yes, yes. My point is that um, through my experience with as an expert witness, I, I see where the problems are and where the holes come up. Some of them are just sort of logical logical holes or, or some of them are sort of evidentiary like recording. And so from my, what I try to do in my work is from my point of view, is to help the forensic team, the handler teams, um, the attorneys to understand the science behind it and so to, to bring better science into the courtroom. And then lastly, sir, um, there were some questions about how you get paid. H have you agreed to work for us for a discounted rate? Yes, I have. Thank you for that. And who recommended you to us? Objection or relevance? Uh, what's the relevance to what's the relevance to that? This, the relevance to this is that they've implied that this gentleman who lives in Florida is is doing this and saying things because he's getting paid to say them instead of because it's scientifically true. Um, I don't see the relevance. And, and he's not sought us out. He was recommended by a, a national agency. It's not relevant. Doctor Ha, do you take? your testimony under oath very seriously? Yes, I do. Would it compromise your ability to continue your work? You can't work? ask that question. You, you, they can't self-bolster their credibility. You, with that, Your Honor, uh, no further questions for the professor. Okay, any questions from the jury? Looks like at least one. Okay, Dr. Ha, two questions, excuse me, two questions from the jury. Uh, have you ever seen a cadaver dog work in the field? Yes, I have. And what type of case was it, and what was your role? Uh, it was a um, case in, in, in Portland where I was um, uh, aware that, made aware as a professor at the university, made aware that this, this search was going on, and I was invited to observe because they, the individuals involved, the handlers involved in it, thought it would be educational for me. Okay. And can dogs smell through plastic bags? Uh, yes, they, uh, let me rephrase that. Depends on the 
type of plastic bag. Um, there's a lot of different kinds of plastic, and some of the plastic, like your typical garbage bags, are very porous. Um, as we talk, commented on, drug smugglers have discovered that. Um, uh, there are types of plastic which, which are impervious, um, and so those are often used in forensic situations where we need to make sure that odors don't mix and, and so on. Okay. Any follow-up from either side? Council's witness. Doctor, is it fair for the jury and everyone to understand you believe in these dogs? You, you know they can do... That's, that's not really following up on these questions. Well, ha having observed them... Um, the, the first question... Have you ever seen him? Yeah. What type of case was it? But, but his belief is was not one of these questions. I mean, you're done with your, your questioning. Okay. Uh, the plastic that would need to be involved, would that be some military-grade plastic? I, it's not the garbage bags that we've seen here. Is that fair? I don't know about military-grade. They're just simply different kinds of plastics, and so you'd want to use a specific kind of, of plastic that is doesn't allow air molecules to, to move across it. It is not garbage any bags. In, yeah. Are there any commercially available garbage bags that are that good? No. Or, or that non-porous? No. I, I, uh, yes. As a, as a scientist, I can go to a laboratory supply place and purchase them. So, yes, they are commercially available. They are not commonly available, if that's what you're asking. Not at the grocery store. Correct. That's it. Thanks. Anything? Yes, Your Honor. So, uh, Dr. You were asked about your work in the field, and you said you've only one time, one case, watched a human remains detection dog, and you were in the role of, a, of observing. Is that correct? That's correct. You're aware that Karen Corcoran's been doing this for 30 years and did more searches than that in this single case than you've ever even observed, right? That's misstating the evidence. She wasn't involved for 30 years. In the field he was referring to, not this case. Well, I'm sorry, for 30 years, with she, she didn't get involved until 2000. You know, I don't remember in any event. I don't think that's a real big difference between 2000s and in any event. 20 years. Let's say 20 years for argument's sake. You're aware she did four searches in the field just in this case alone, correct? Sure. Yes. With, o with over 40 trained final responses, to which you're attributing her on the basis of no literature, at least a 60% success rate. Correct. Correct? Correct. And based on your one instance of observing a cadaver dog in the field, you're pining on her reliability? Uh, abs absolutely. I, I have no problem based on scientific principles. I am not uh -huh. opining on her leash handling ability or how she uh, commanded the dog, as we discussed. Um, I am talking Thank about you, sir. the accuracy overall. On that one issue, do you have any, any follow-up? No, thanks. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, our next witness is also going to be by video, so we don't want to break it down and have somebody come in for a short period of time because it takes it's too hard to set up. So um, remember my admonitions. Don't talk to, about the case uh, either between yourselves or anyone else. Don't let it, any third party uh, discuss it. Don't talk to the lawyers or the any witnesses or the defendant. Don't gather any information on your own. Don't decide this case or start talking about the case until uh, it's all over with and I've told you to do so. So with that, um, let's start up again at 10 after 1. All right. Everybody raise for the jury. Okay, hey, we'll be in recess. Thank you. You bet. Oh, Mr. Hott, Dr. Hot, I'm sorry. You're you're good to go. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> totally forgot about you. <laughs> Thank you. You bet.
Yeah. Now we're good. Have a good lunch. Thank you.